So welcome to this Design Builder webinar on Design Stage Performance Modeling in Design Builder. I'm Dave Cocking, and the main presenter today will be Nishesh Jain. I'll start first with the context behind today's webinar. The maturity and application of low energy and sustainable design varies quite a lot globally, but the use of simulation to improve building performance has grown significantly in most countries and regions in recent decades. Various forms of compliance modeling largely at the early design and planning stages of construction, have previously dominated that modelling growth. Although it's widely misunderstood and often misused, compliance modelling does have its place and it has helped to push forward the agenda on building related carbon emissions. We all know it's not perfect, but there are aspects that, that, have, that it's done um, a good job on. But compliance modelling is typically simplified and it's heavily constrained. And it's often used inappropriately designed tool as a design tool, kind of way beyond its intended compliance benchmarking use. This frequently leads to a significant gap between predicted compliance performance and measured in-use performance. Performance modelling, on the other hand, provides a more reliable way of accurately modelling predicting, uh, predicting in-use energy performance. So it's now increasingly being used for sustainable building design. In addition to improving operational and energy performance, it can help to inform and optimise future retrofit priorities. A structured performance modelling approach, such as those found in methodologies like SIBSI TM54, Neighbours, ASHRAE, Standard 209, etc., could be very helpful in delivering building performance design objectives in actual operation of the building. In this webinar, Nishesh will use TM54 as a vehicle to discuss the key principles of performance modelling at both the early and more advanced stages of building design. Nishesh was on the committee that updated TM54 in 2022, so you're definitely in good hands there. Before I hand over to Nishesh, I'll highlight the Energy Plus capabilities that relate specifically to this webinar. So firstly, we have the Design Builder Modeler for fast geometry and model data input, and the ability to visualize uh, your model and aspects of, uh, of the, uh, the building itself. We have the simulation uh, option for um, a variety of, of different uh, analyses and um, different ways to display results. Different HVAC modelling options, uh, Nishesh will talk uh, more about those today. And finally, specifically in the context of this webinar, optimization, but more importantly perhaps here, uncertainty and sensitivity analysis. As far as we know, Design Builder is still the only mainstream software with fully integrated, um, fully developed uncertainty and sensitivity tools to aid risk assessment and decision making. These are actually quite important in the context of performance modelling, and the chef will discuss that in um, a lot more detail in his presentation. Although there are other significant capabilities in Design Builder, including uh, radiance daylighting and CFD, for example, they won't be discussed today. Design Builder is different to the other mainstream simulation softwares. It makes modeling buildings and their systems from early through detailed modeling stages faster, easier, 
and more productive. You can seamlessly progress an early stage model and compliance model into a performance model without having to use another model or start again in different software. And obviously in the context of performance modeling, that's also quite important. So now I've covered the context and highlighted the design builder capabilities that relate to today's topic, I'll hand you over uh, to Nishesh. Thanks, Dave. So um, in, in this webinar, um, we will start with exploring the use of performance modeling in building procurement and explore various modeling methods, their needs, requirements, and applications. We will look into a structured modeling workflow for creating better and more accurate performance models. Following the steps in SIPC's TM54, we will develop an early design stage model. <clears throat> steps are similar to other good practice modeling guides used globally. So while my focus will be on TM54, the processes and key concepts for the protocol followed would be similar to guides such as Neighbors or ASHRAE uh, Standard 209. <clears throat> we will also be looking at ways to present results for better and clearer communication about projected performance for more informed design decisions. Finally, we will review modeling done at advanced stages of design with detailed systems and controls, and also look into the role the building performance modeling plays in performance evaluations after occupancy. <clears throat> Why performance modeling? Providing estimates of energy use at design stage can allow designers, building owners, and prospective occupiers to understand where and how building is likely to be used uh, and its energy consumption. It builds realistic expectations about the performance of the building. It allows designers to understand which energy performance measures will have the greatest impact on energy use and informs energy use targets which can be compared to operational data to identify opportunities to tune and optimize the building in use. Building procurement process goes through multiple phases. Key tasks include project conceptualization and planning, design development phase, construction and handover phase, and post-completion operations and maintenance. The typical role in initial stages related to energy and environmental performance is to determine if the project targets and benchmarks can be achieved, therefore setting realistic expectations. And beyond that, compliance-related modeling is also undertaken, which may extend into design stages as well. Most of the modeling we typically do, that is performance modeling, happens during design stages. And as the design evolves, the model evolves and gets customized to project specific details. In this webinar, we are focusing on this performance projection approach. Into the construction and handover stages, value engineering often drives changes in building design and specification. Therefore, upon handover, the model should be updated so that it aligns with the as-built building. Ideally, at this stage, the model should show the intended operational energy and comfort targets are easily available. The role of modeling does not necessarily stop once the building is occupied. Calibrated models can be used to help to understand the underlying performance issues and give insights into operational inefficiencies, along with pinpointing the root causes. This is especially useful during the initial years of operation as the building and the systems are fine-tuned. This is how these tasks and models align with REBA stages for projects. <clears throat> Key guidance on each of these modeling processes can be found in guides and documents for benchmarks and compliance modeling. These are 
generally local documents that vary by country and region and more broadly applicable guides exist for performance modeling at design stage and for post occupancy evaluations key issues that affect modeling and should be taken note of by modelers are compliance models that are created for comp comparative assessment and benchmarking however results from compliance models are often mistakenly interpreted as predictions of actual energy use it has to be remembered that compliance models are often hugely simplified and their purpose is different when compared to performance modeling generic design and operational assumptions are often used in <clears throat> compliance models building specific model data should be used in performance modeling when modeling at design stages it is common tendency to project energy use as a fixed number without properly assessing the likelihood of achieving it as a good practice multiple scenarios including likely high-end and low end energy use should be explored as this design goes through the construction and until handover changes in design or op proposed constructions occur such as operating hours changes or product substitution during value engineering at relevant stages especially at handover the model and projected performance should be updated Poor commissioning of actual building can also be a cause of discrepancy in ideal performance as per the design intent and projected by the models compared to what is happening in reality. Our focus in this webinar is performance modeling and these are the typical guides that are used in industry such as ASHRAE standard 209, neighbors design for performance guide, and SIP CTM 54. These are like there are likely to be um, other similar guides available globally that provide clear guidance on how to evaluate operational energy use at design stage. These documents are complementary. I was involved in the recent update to uh, SIP CTM 54, so I'll use that as an example to illustrate what these guides usually contain. The M54 provides guidance on predictive energy performance modeling during design stage. It explains the importance of accurately estimating the operating hours and likely occupancy levels. It emphasizes the accounting of unregulated end uses such as lifts, escalators, small power loads, catering, server rooms in building energy totals. Practical recommendations for good modeling can be broadly categorized into two parts. Firstly, the recommendations for better calculations and then recommendation for better presentation and explanation of results. Better calculations require use of appropriate simulation software and use of project specific assumptions. The second part is to present the calculation results for a holistic understanding of the scale for the stakeholders. This is done via scenario analysis, sensitivity analysis, and comparing the performance against similar buildings, that is benchmarking. This is the step-by-step -step methodology presented in CPCTM 54 document, which I will use in this webinar. This is slightly different than the normal design builder modeling workflow used in our training and tutorials, but largely covers the same aspects overall. For simplicity, I have divided it into six parts. The first part is more strategic and focuses on using the right modeling approach and detail. The next three parts relate to developing a model with correct geometry, model data, and HVAC systems. This is effectively our baseline or starting model of the modeling process upon which further steps are built 
for better performance assessment and communication of results. This starts with assessment of uncertainty in projected results and then also testing the model robustness by undertaking sensitivity and scenario analysis. The process also compares projected energy use against project targets and industry benchmarks. Initial decision before we start performance modeling is what type of modeling you need for your project. There are different levels of modeling depending on the need and complexity of the project. Quasi steady state modeling and dynamic simulation modeling. Steady state models such as PHPP used in passive house design, although relatively simpler in nature, can be useful for simple projects where heating demands drive space loads. They can be less reliable for bigger projects with varying thermal loads, complex controls, and especially where cooling demand is significant. Dynamic simulation models, in theory, provide a better estimate of energy use compared to steady state calculations as they take into account more of the complexities of variation in energy use across time and intersections between different parts of building systems. Our focus will be on dynamic simulation as our modeling approach here. Let's review the model I will be using in today's demonstration. This is a student accommodation block model. The building has eight single occupancy ensuite flats, four on each floor. The ground floor has a kitchen and the upper floor is largely identical except that it has a common room instead of the kitchen there's a building adjacent to the east of the student accommodation block which will shade and reflect onto our building model data is set under the model data tabs and we will uh, set and review those settings as we go through the modeling process In step one in modeling is to create the accurate geometry and define correct location details. Geometry forms the basis of all future calculations that are undertaken by your model. Its accuracy and quality will therefore reflect the accuracy of your future model outputs. Many factors should be considered when generating a model, such as keeping it simple, but defining the opaque and non-opaque fabric properties correctly, including details such as thermal bridging or window frame effects. Then also apply correct shading such as louvers, overhangs, canopies, and other buildings and trees. Another aspect to take care when creating the geometry is to configure the zones and zone groups correctly. Further guidance on constructing a suitable model is available in the various guides I mentioned earlier. An important aspect is how to work with large models. Design Builder has been used to successfully model and simulate very large buildings with over 2000 zones and huge floor areas. Design Builder's knowledge base article here provides great tips on how to maximize productivity in cases of large models the link is here but i'll show you how to access useful resources like this um, from the knowledge base at the end of the webinar location forms the next aspect of the initial model setup this governs the key factors including weather data and parameters for heating and cooling design calculations.
an appropriate weather file specific to your building location should be used for building specific projections if more accurate weather data is available for a nearer weather station in climatically similar location then you should use that in the baseline projections it's important that the weather data used for baseline modeling should be typical years and not design years more details about this you can find when you search about various types of weather files next step is operating hours and occupancy it's important that the correct zoning and activities are defined for the model operating hours and occupancy schedules should be set as accurately as possible as well when we start modeling we use typical operational profiles in common standards for occupancy and loads such as schedules here for a student accommodation bedroom space in typical databases would assume that there is occupancy during the evenings and overnight and no occupancy during the day when the students are in lectures etc so in most scenarios these operational assumptions might be realistic however when developing a model every assumption should be questioned and verified and um, from yourself and getting information from your client and stakeholders because contrasting this with a typical operational assumption which we have against monitored electricity load profile from a couple of actual student residences at university college london provides an interesting insight into student building operating trends what is clearly visible here is that the assumed slump during the day in a typical schedule is not evident in these student accommodations and note this is pre pandemic data therefore what we conclude is that even though projects which might be in the same category due to contextual reasons might have different operations a structured discussion with the client is useful in cases to understand the typical occupancy or operating hours along with the way the building will be managed and ideally this should be backed up by data rather than guesstimates let's customize our model for more accurate occupancy inputs in our case in the model relevant activities have been defined for various spaces throughout the building such as uh, bathrooms circulation bedrooms etc as i highlighted earlier typical data might not be suitable for occupancy and operating hours in our building for example the default occupancy density for our flat is 0.12 people per meter square and typical area for each of the flats is 30 to 35 square meters full occupancy therefore will be four persons now our design is for a single occupancy uh, unit so therefore i would need to change this occupancy number i will set the occupancy method to number of people and set it to be 1 additionally i have created a new occupancy schedule that accounts for some occupancy during the day you can see the occupancy profile selected here
the next few slides require modifications to other loads and their schedules such as lighting equipment gains from plant and other systems I have to now make these multiple changes to customize my model itself in relation to these gains. I can do it in various ways by modifying the model inputs here, but I will use the grid view tool where I have set up a mechanism to modify these quickly. I will filter the data by activity type. So I'll select all the bedrooms and um, see that the occupancy schedule are here, the new one and the number of people. They have been correctly set from what I um, set earlier. For rest of the data, I will edit, edit them in bulk. Heating set point temperature, I'll change it to 22 degrees set back to 16 um, equipment power density to be 8 watts per meter square uh, because i wish to modify the equipment energy use um, and equipment schedule i would also need to change to the one which i have created which is more representative of the expected energy use in the building so i'll search for and set it besides this i have also updated hot water demand auxiliary energy loads along with uh, heating operation schedule cooling schedules and um, lighting gains etc uh, in the model for an actual project you would go into much more detail in customizing your inputs but for this demonstration um, I, this is sufficient and introduction on setting up model data in design builder uh, for setting up all these inputs which we discussed is available through our free uh, tutorials on the design builder website and also for a full understanding on these there are uh, on demand online training courses also available after adding the data for these baseline projections the last item is hvac system design depending on the design stage and the complexity of the building systems their controls system uh, level design can be done as simple or detailed hvac typically in early design stages simple hvac is okay to use as it uses plant loads and seasonal cop values to calculate the hvac energy use however at more advanced stages or where complex system controls are being modeled component level modeling with performance curves for hvac energy calculations may be preferred typically as the design evolves your model will also evolve with these details where necessary in an earlier webinar we showed you how to work with simple HVAC systems and switch to detailed HVAC in the same model as your project and design evolves. You can access this recording from our webinars page. In this demo, I am modeling a simple HVAC system. So I'll go to the HVAC tab and the HVAC system is a VRF system providing heating and cooling and natural ventilation has also been selected to provide fresh air. Once the model has reached at this stage, that is the location, geometry, model data and HVAC systems are defined as per the design, 
the baseline model is complete and you can run the simulations i will now run the simulation for a full year and request uh, annual total results in this simulation i am only interested in annual fuel breakdown um, in this instance so i did not ask for more detailed outputs such as internal gains surface level outputs comfort level results for environment uh, environmental conditions etc at much higher granularity as well i would have done that if i was analyzing the building performance in more detail also um, it is a good practice to do proper qa checks to your model before you embark on uh, these final runs i have skipped these to save time uh, but you can do this by simulating short time periods at high time frequency like hourly or sub hourly levels to ensure that the systems and operations are running as they should this type of uh, sanity checking and qa checking is uh, you do is kind of essential um, and good practice modeling for the simulations um i've finished so i'll see the result i look at the fuel breakdown at run period levels and look at graph and table normalized by the area so this is the projected energy use based on realistic operating conditions and um, represents the baseline energy use The energy use projection calculated in accordance with TM54 guidelines with the building specific inputs results in a total projection of 78 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum. This projection accounts for all anticipated energy uses in the building rather than just the regulatory loads or central plant equipment. Therefore, this provides a holistic view of the building's performance. Now moving on to the next part, that is presentation of results that account for uncertainty. After the initial baseline projection, sensitivity analysis and scenario testing should be done at appropriate stages to understand the factors that are likely to have the greatest impact on the end energy consumption of the building, presenting the results as a range. For that, you would have to define normally via interviews with the stakeholders the key parameters that might vary between the design and operation stages such as hvac system specifications operation protocols and occupancy patterns etc so why do we need to look at uncertainty models are created using assumptions as the design evolves some of these assumptions become more certain but others specifically related to operations and occupant behavior will remain uncertain this means that there will always be a difference between the building's predicted performance and how the building is actually likely to operate additionally designs often go through changes such as value engineering therefore using these analysis we can gain an understanding on how important some of these design changes are and consequently we can make the stakeholders aware of the need to safeguard the energy conservation measures sensitivity analysis is a study of how variation in model in outputs can be attributed to uncertainties in its various inputs. Thus, it helps to identify the most important input variables in a model. So, how to go about a sensitivity analysis? Basic sensitivity tests is a simple approach of making iterative changes, such as those for weather or occupancy related factors, and then checking 
the impact on the results. The magnitude of the change can tell that in this graph, for example, where each calculation, each one parameter was changed in the baseline model, sensitivity of energy use in the baseline model to the operating hours is much more than the sensitivity towards improvement in system efficiency. Therefore, we can see which parameter has higher impact and therefore more important for future building operations. A more structured way of assessing sensitivity is to do a multi-parameter analysis. This holistic analysis allows you to determine the combined effect of changing multiple inputs because combined effect may not be directly equivalent to some of its parts and some variables may cross compensate each other. Design builder can do these analysis in an automated way and this module is fully integrated into the modeling interface. You can identify and rank design inputs in terms of importance and this parametric approach is especially useful in quantifying risk in projects procured under performance contracting where more accuracy is needed. This uncertainty and sensitivity analysis webinar looks at the quantified risk assessment reports using sensitivity analysis to measure and manage the risk associated with achieving high performance target in an energy performance contracting project which was designed to achieve state-of-the-art level A rating in the UK. The use of sensitivity analysis is shown in great detail in this application. Scenario testing or scenario analysis aims to quantify the total variability in the calculation results due to all of the uncertainties in model inputs. Typically to show probabilistically the results, four scenarios can be communicated to the clients. First is a mid-range scenario, our baseline run. This is the best estimate which we have based on reasonable assumptions for the building operations, system efficiencies, controls and management regimes. The analysis which we just did, the most likely option. Then it is the high end and low end scenarios which represent the likely range of output uncertainty. That is the likely energy use variation based on reasonable variations in inputs such as building occupancy or operations. And finally, there is a worst case scenario which can be modeled, which would assume a high degree of mismanagement and inefficiencies in building construction and operation. In the event of worst case scenario, uh, the intent is to inform the project team about the potential negative impact of their actions. So while high end represents the realistic high energy use, the worst case is worst performance due to mismanagement. The factors you would consider in developing different scenarios will be variables that have strong influence on the results as identified by sensitivity analysis, especially if they vary in a wide range or are subject to low confidence intervals or levels. Things such as controls for heating or cooling uh, or when windows are open can be considered to be changed occupancy hours or operation of the building, internal gain levels and their uh, schedules, such as for equipment and lighting. Scenarios can be explored for different plant systems and uh, equipments and their efficiencies. Weather-based scenario can also be tested by using different weather data, such as extreme weather cold or hot hot cold winter or hot summers or future climate scenarios 
management actions can also be changed that may impact the running of the building and its services. Important thing to note here is that scenarios to test will vary according to the project and discussions with your stakeholders. A quick scenario analysis was done for this demonstration model by modifying these input parameters under the low, medium and high scenario options. The medium scenario as discussed is the is our baseline estimate of the building energy use and high and low options uh, result here shows the probable range within which the inputs in the medium range can vary uh, medium uh, scenario can vary these inputs uh, could relate to impact of building controls and building management such as these these inputs there can be occupancy and occupant related factors typical variations which happen in internal loads as the building is used range of system efficiency variations and various future weather scenarios simulations were run with these three set of settings to create simulation results the results plotted show the annual error range that is the low end the mid range and high end scenarios and where the actual performance would likely uh, be between these two bands where this is our most likely estimate scenario results can also be plotted as box plots for different end uses separately in this graph the bar shows the median value and the error line shows the low and high range estimate so some end uses are more uncertain than the others the final part of tm54 is to compare the calculated performance against benchmarks of actual building data this is a comparison of our demonstration model against the benchmark numbers given in SIPC for good practice uh, in this building type. The building design projection along with high-end scenario is within the limit. So it's likely that the building, even if it is not operating as per design conditions, would still be better than the good practice benchmark. Design Builder and so um, in early stages simulation can be used to test and refine operational energy targets under a range of real world scenarios using initial performance models with simple HVAC. As design progresses areas where detailed HVAC modeling is particularly beneficial. A greater ability to optimize air side modeling of mechanical ventilation systems or water side modeling of heating and cooling systems, including heat recovery, can be used. HVAC modeling is also useful to simulate heating and cooling plant, fan, pump, and performance of various equipments in more detail, plus testing of various control options. Design Builder Detailed HVAC Modeling provides a proper representation of a system operation for calculating HVAC energy use. It incorporates each individual component within the HVAC system using manufacturer's information about part load performance to describe the performance of each component. Controls within the simulations reflect the controls proposed within the design. The detailed HVAC model is bespoke to a project. It is debatable that with the increasing number of input options, detailed HVAC modeling in more uh, detail at design stages adds or reduces the accuracy 
uh, of the results when compared to a simplified approach in my opinion decision whether to use simple or detailed hvac should be based on the stage of the building procurement at which the model is being created in early stages of design it is generally uh, all right to use simple hvac as additional time involved might not be justified if the model is being done at advanced stages of building procurement or when the HVAC system details are being finalized, then detailed HVAC system modeling would typically be helpful. During the construction stages, it is recommended that simulation model is kept live and updated with changes, change decisions such as value engineering happening. It should at least be updated at practical completion based on as constructed commissioning information so that upon handover, the model aligns fully with the actual building. This model can then be used to fine tune the building during initial years of occupation and indicate remedial actions. Regularly reviewing energy performance of any building once it is occupied is vital element in achieving and maintaining high levels of performance. In the coming years, post-occupancy evaluation is expected to become more commonplace. Post-occupancy evaluation allows a holistic comparison of building performance with the design stage intents and building targets to establish whether the building is performing as intended. This provides opportunities to identify shortcomings and enable their diagnostics, remediation, measures, for future project teams to learn lessons. Modeling via development of calibrated models can also be vital tool to help in a robust building and systems evaluation. Use of calibrated models as a part of post-occupancy evaluation and building retrofit projects has been detailed in different industry guidance documents such as ASHRAE guideline 14, IPMVP, and SIPC's TM63. These are complementary guidance documents. TM63 builds on the other two, especially regarding the use of model calibration as a part of systematic post-occupancy performance evaluations. TM63 provides a procedural and replicable evidence-based methodology to develop a calibrated model which can be used for diagnosing performance issues. This calibrated model sits in the heart of a step-by-step -step measurement and verification framework to quantify and identify causes of building performance issues. So with Design Builder, it is fast and straightforward to update your model as your project evolves. You could start with a compliance or regulatory model then develop it into a design stage model in early and detailed stages and then use it post completion in a calibration process using simulation based post occupancy evaluation there is a relevant case study on design builder website um, about this so we go to the website and more case studies So this is using a uh, SIPC TM54 and TM63 to accurately assess the in-use performance in Design Builder. This case study highlights how design stage performance model was developed and then calibrated to undertake post-occupancy evaluation. There are various other case studies as well, which you can look at. Other resources that I mentioned during the webinar uh, included uh, knowledge base. So go to support, knowledge base, and I can search um, what I want to find here. So say large models.
and this is the modeling tips page which i showed working with large models and speeding up simulations besides that our tutorials the free tutorials will help you um, get up to speed with the software basics very quickly and however if you are learning for uh looking for a more um, structured and detailed learning then our on-demand training is the best option this training content is delivered by design builder expert technical staff you can complete it at your own pace and you will receive a certificate um, after completion besides this i also mentioned our past webinars page um, so this is another free resource for learning advanced aspects of uh, design builder so that's all for me today uh, do remember to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on linkedin where we regularly post content on software news upcoming events and webinars along with tips and tricks Thank you.